So what can we turn behind the theme? Today we'll be talking about Sekigahara again, and today we'll be talking about the sieges of Sekigahara. Now, the sieges are actually a lot more interesting in my view than many of the other aspects of the Sekigahara campaign. And also, minus the actual battle itself, these sieges were actually a lot more influential on the eventual outcome of the campaign and the battle itself than one would think. So let's get into it. Now, the most of what happened during the sieges and all that has an involvement of the horticulture of the samurai, and this involved the very high basis of honor that they put on attacking or even on self sacrifice and all that. That led to a lot of very strange situations, and sometimes some situations that led to a change of history in Japan, as of course the result of Sekigahara did. To give you a quick example of this, the siege of Gifu, when Tokugawa first was going back west, the castle itself was held by the heir to the older clan. Now, the older clan, of course, was the clan that had preeminence to taking over Japan before the Toyotomi took over in that position. And when hostilities broke out, a lot of advisors to the daimyo of the older clan told him that he should turn towards Tokugawa. For obvious reasons, of course, because also the Toyotomi, of course, had eclipsed and taken over the position of the older clan. But to show you how much Hideyoshi, the Taiko, how good he was at diplomacy and also on a person-to-person basis, the older daimyo actually stayed loyal and chose to fight for the Toyotomi cause. Now, on top of that, the another honor-based situation that happened during the Gifu Sea was the two leaders that Tokugawa had sent over to attack the castle, Ikeda Terumasa and Fukushima Masanori. Now, the two of them got there and they started to siege the castle, but unfortunately, due to the honor of attacking the castle first, both people could not agree who to lead the attack and both felt that they should get the honor of it. This led to a, such a bad situation. Both people started challenging each other to personal duels. Thank God before they struck blows, they came to a consensus that one person would attack one castle from one side, the other would attack the castle from the other side, therefore they would attack simultaneously. Again, the honor of attacking first could have led to a disaster for the Tokugawa, not being able to take one of the very strategic positions of Gifu. And in case you're wondering, uh, Gifu did fall, but the, the heir to Oda Nobunaga, the daimyo of the Oda clan, was actually captured and allowed to retire to a monastery to sit out the rest of the Sekigahara campaign. Now, the best show of, I would say, Bushido in the whole Sekigahara campaign was that of Tori Mototada. Now, before Tokugawa had left for the east to head towards the deal with Uesugi Kagekatsu, he had to leave a garrison at Fushimi, alright? Fushimi being one of the power bases, and he left his um, good friend Tori Motodada in charge with about a thousand men. Tori Motodada was extremely loyal to Tokugawa, and in fact both of them were hostages to the same lord when they were kids, so basically the both of them kind of grew up together. But during this last meeting, it was said that they both shared a drink together and they talked the whole night, but it was literally a farewell because both people knew that there would be no help coming. And a large force of the Western army would descend upon Fushimi with no chance of reinforcements. Mototada agreed to take the test and very importantly hold the Western and delay the Western forces as long as possible to allow time for Tokugawa to gather his forces and to deal with the situation in the east, then move his troops to the west. He was outnumbered about 20 to 1. He had about a thousand men but he was sieged by about 15,000 or more men. Again, uh, different sources give different numbers, it's, but it's about there. And he fought so hard that he started with about 1,000 men, and then fought down to 200 men, and then fought down to 10 men, and even at the point when 10 men, I think we all could agree, if he had surrendered, many people would still say he had kept his honor. But he did not, and he fought literally to the last man, and of course was killed. Strangely to say, he actually would have held on long, also speaking to the defenses of Fushimi Castle itself. The West Army actually caught the families, all the defenders, and said that they would crucify them. Not one thing that he um, basically burned down one of the towers, started firing one of the towers in Fushimi, and thus allowed the Western Army a route in, and therefore leading to the downfall of the entire Fushimi and of course Tori Mototada. And on top of that, Tori Mototada held out all the way from the 27th of August all the way to the 6th of September. And for his 1,000 defenders, he bled the Western Army of 3,000 men. This story kind of leads to a very high bar of Bushido or warrior honor among the whole of Japan even to this day. 
that makes it is it truly altruistic you know that's the cool thing about japanese culture as you see that in um several times in the sekigahara campaign especially even with the next episode i'll talk about sanada masayuki and throughout japanese history where they do things like my favorite character in Game of Thrones, which is Tywin Man and stuff, that they will actually suffer themselves so that the family name will continue stronger, you know. In the case of Torimoto Tada, he actually wrote a letter to his son before the siege. And in this letter, he actually says that he does this not only for honor and everything, but also for the family. And that the son should work hard so that his sacrifice would not be in vain, just like Tywin Lannister many times in the novel. Now, the most interesting siege, in my view, was that of Hosokawa Yusai. Now, Hosokawa Yusai, if you remember from the last episode, from the family name, was the father-in-law to Dona Garcia, the Christian lady who was baptized and she was a Japanese lady married to the daimyo or the Hosokawa clan. Her suicide and the burning of her residence, basically her death led to the everlasting hate of the Hosokawa clan and, of course, no exception to her father-in-law, Hosokawa Yusai. Now, the strange thing is, was everybody wanted Yusai on their side because I, I thought about this, and the best example is like, think like if Albert Einstein had to choose, you know, whichever side he chose would gain a huge morale boost because almost everybody in the country respected him. Yusai at the time was a very well known scholar, a poet, and very much so respected. Now, of course, he chose for the Tokugawa. And he basically pulled back his troops. He and about 500 men pulled back into Tanabe Castle in Tango Province. Now, this was actually virtually suicide because already, as we have talked about Torimoto Tada, there was, in the west of Japan, not much help coming at the time. And Moto Tada had about 1,000 men. Yusai had about 500. And of course, the same thing with Torimoto Tada. He was surrounded. I said he was surrounded even more outnumbered than Mototada. He was surrounded by 15,000 men to his 500. So Yusai was surrounded, and what should have been a very quick siege turned into a two-month ordeal for the Western Army. Of course, the main reason was no one wanted to kill Yusai. Like I said, it's like if you had to attack a fort with Albert Einstein in it. All right, No one wanted to be the one that killed Albert Einstein. On top of that, Inside Yusai's castle, he had a lot of irreplaceable ancient works and scrolls, which also people didn't want to destroy. On top of that, many of the people sieging the castle that Yusai was in were used to be his students. So this whole situation led to literally accounts of people would start an attack, they would load cannon, but with gunpowder and everything, but there would be no cannonballs in it. So it was literally a siege with cannon and no cannonballs. And basically, they kept delaying and delaying and delaying. And of course, for obvious reasons that we know, could not take the castle. Now, Yusai, afraid that sooner or later that the castle would get taken down, all right, asked that the irreplaceable works that he had would be sent to the emperor, all right, for safekeeping and all. So what they did was that they asked for an imperial envoy to come all the way to talk and collect these um, works, and while then the Imperial Envoy actually had to beg Yusai that he was too valuable to lose and that would he just surrender. Yusai gave up the works and said that at heart he's a samurai and he's not going to surrender. So then the Emperor himself had to then order Yusai to surrender, at which point he finally did and he retired to basically Kyoto to complete his um, own studies and everything. But by then, he had already done his job because he and his 500 men basically helped 15,000 men from Sekigahara, holding out for two months against a situation that should never have happened. So that's some of the very interesting sieges in the Sekigahara campaign. Next time, we'll talk about another few very interesting sieges and let me know what you think. Let me know if you know anything interesting about the history and what you think about samurai culture and this whole honor-based situation. It led to so many weird situations in Japanese history. Thank you very much. Till next word.